Good morning, good morning, and welcome back to Good Morning Tobago right here on Tobago Updates. This morning, as we continue our conversation, we are talking about crime and security, as well as migration within the region. And as we have that conversation this morning, I have the privilege of chatting online with Mr. Stuart Tony Stephenson, who is the Crime and Security Manager at the CARICOM Secretariat. Good morning and welcome. Morning and thank you for having the opportunity to meet with you and the rest of the region. All right. Well, it is a pleasure to have you on with us this morning. I hope that you are hearing me clearly. I am hearing you quite clearly. All right. Um, now, when persons think about migrating throughout the region, we have always thought that CARICOM allows for the free movement of CARICOM members to move between CARICOM countries. Now, you at the Secretariat have been working on a migration policy. So can you tell us what existed before and what exists now or what it is that the policy is now working towards clarifying? Okay, so what you've described earlier on in terms of persons moving between the region, we, we term free movement. Um, but we do recognize that persons moving presents as well a development opportunity. So heads of government had created a space prior to this um, for persons to have the opportunity to move. And you'll be aware that we started um, with specific skill sets and persons. But the migration policy goes beyond um, just the movement of persons. As I indicated earlier, it goes into areas where we are using the, the, the movement of persons for development needs and to be able to do that in a safe and regulated environment. Um, some of the challenges we've had as a region um, in, in terms of our health professionals and in terms of our education professionals um, present a prime example of how the migration policy itself can help. There's a really strong labor component involved in the migration policy that is being developed. And of course, we want to be able to also take advantage of skill sets that are outside of our region that has come to a region where we are lacking. And the policy is going to help in adjusting just that. All right. And is there a particular area of focus in regards to what the needs are in particular territories? For example, is there a list or would there, does the policy include um, nations or sorry countries being able to put out a list of needed areas for specialty i am really glad you asked that question um so initially the mandate came through our heads of conference of heads of government um subsequent to that our ministers of national security met sorry our ministers of um foreign relations met and they also determined that in implementing the migration policy the priorities for nationals and national member states needed to be taken into consideration. And we have begun that journey. We've had an initial um, round of consultations last year um, with all member states um, where they were to indicate what their challenges were for migration, where the gaps they had um, in terms of movement of persons lay, and what were their priorities for moving forward. Um, subsequent to that, because we, we identified quite a few gaps, we have formed a, a governance structure to deal with the implementation of the migration policy. So this structure consists of a steering committee, which is comprised the CARICOM Secretariat, CARICOM Impacts, or Implementing Agency for Crime and Security, um, representation for the organization of the Eastern Caribbean states, as well as our technical support um, moving forward, the International Office of Migration. This steering committee sits above um, two um, important bodies and that we've merged together. This includes our regional institutions that have some sort of responsibility for migration. And this would include the implementing agency for crime and security, as I said before, um, because we need to be able to move safely. It also includes CAFA, our Caribbean public health agency, because persons also move. And of course, we recognize that the, just pand the pandemic that we just held, um, that was just had in, you know, around 2020, where it ended, um, resulted in a serious constriction of movement for persons. So they form a key uh, partnership in it. 
And of course, we've also merged with our United Nations um, organizations that have some kind of responsibility for migration. This is the International Labour Organization, IOM, as I described, UN Women, all of the above. Um, and the third tier in this um, framework involves focal points from member states where we have been speaking with permanent secretaries, with all of the ministries that have some kind of responsibility around movement of persons. And, and it's important to point out it's not just national security here, um, but ministries of youth, gender, health and education and social development. So certainly the needs of persons have been taken into consideration. Um, earlier on this year, we have started a final round of consultation to develop the framework, um, which is going to act as a toolkit to assist member states in developing their own national policies. So the policy and the framework is very much citizen-centered um, to be able to identify those needs um, within the member states and then be able to address them from a developmental perspective. All right, excellent. And what I want to find out is what aspect of the policy deals with attitudes? Because within the region, you know, we still have I don't know if to call it so, somewhat of a xenophobic attitude towards particular countries. Um, you know, uh, I don't want to go ahead of myself, but you find that persons would feel some type of way about Caribbean nationals, even though we are all from the Caribbean, who come from particular countries. In the past, I've seen it, you know, um, whether, I don't want to call any countries, but you know, they, they, when they find out that, you know, you, you came to their country from a particular country, they always feel like, you know, you have come to try to, you know, um, benefit economically. And there's a negative attitude connected to that. How do we change that to a positive attitude of embracing our Caribbean brothers and sisters when they do move here, you know? And again, thank you very much for that question. So the answer speaks to our communication strategy, um, which is key in terms of gathering the stories of persons who have moved, as well as creating um, mainstream and sustained relationships with our social media, as well as our, like you, like you yourself here this morning, our media personnel. Uh, media personnel is a critical component of the work that we're doing moving forward. And um, we've recognized that once you begin to tell the story, persons will tend to relate. It has to be relatable. Um, the migration policy is focused on what can a migration policy do for me as an ordinary citizen moving forward so that those answers are clearly stated and clearly represented. Uh, we know that most often times, if you have a conversation with anybody in the region, that we would find that they have links in various islands. Um, I myself have my great-grandparents from Barbados um, residing, um, and then we've come, I grew up in Trinidad and Tobago, and now I'm working in Guyana. Um, and you'd find that this is the case for quite a lot of our national citizens. Persons are moving. We've had a very positive relationship moving forward. Um, with respect to movements of persons, another important statistic we found that is over 60% of the persons that move within the region are women, and they move for the purpose of employment and seeking to gain a better type of understanding, a better life for their um, families. An important statistic that is now arising has to do with um, our concern for migrants or persons who will be moving based on the negative effects of our hurricanes that we've seen becoming even stronger and even more regular in the region. In fact, the term climate migrant is being starting to be coined. Um, so we recognize that if you look, remember, recall a few years ago, when one of the hurricanes devastated one of our member states, um, they had to move. We've had incidences of volcanic eruptions that caused people, and people needed to move. And I don't think that once the rest of the region is aware of the kinds of movements and the kinds of challenges that persons feel, as well as the opportunities that will present to additional member states for bringing in skill sets for things that we do not normally have, um, then that form, forms quite a very strong argument for how we move. A lot of the movement takes place between our young persons and helps our social media platform forms a key strategy in terms of how we reach out and gather not just 
tell persons that we've done this and this is how you intend to respond, but to find out from those demographics, what are their challenges, what are their concerns with movement, and begin to address those. So certainly, um, communication, our communication strategy is a very key component of this um, framework going forward. All right. Is, is the policy complete or is it still being worked on? Okay, so we've had the first draft of the framework um, and it's going through technical um, review currently. Uh, we've had two technical reviews at this point. The next um, focus would be sending that back out to the focal points within member states that have been established to work alongside us in developing the migration policy. And in November, we have a high level uh, meeting that is going to be between the key ministries um, that support the migration policy um, for discussions and talk. Um, in February 2025, we project that we'll be able to take the framework after it has been worked through the region, um, visible to the region, and persons within the regions have had their input um, to present that to our heads of government at the next February sitting in 2025. All right, and well, I guess you might still be open to a number of recommendations. Um, so Tell maybe me. persons can reach out to you and give those recommendations. But for me particularly, um, after studying in the Netherlands, there was this thing called an orientation year. And I know that a number of Caribbean students move back and forth between different Caribbean countries to study. So um, is there a possibility to have that orientation or what they call a search year that allows students to stay in the country that they pursued um, their bachelor's or their master's degree or any research actually in to allow them one year to search for a job within that country um, that would then allow them to acquire a work permit and possibly um, become a permanent resident there if they so desire. Okay, thank you. A lot of what you have described, we will be addressing underneath the labor component of the uh, migration policy. Um, so that is going to be um, our first deeper dive um, into specific segments, because even though we're developing the policy, we recognize that there are some areas um, that the policy touches on that needs to be um, implemented almost immediately. So a lot of those issues that you just raised would form part of the considerations for um, the labor component of the migration policy. Because you, you've recognized that most persons move, even students, um, for the chance to have a better quality of life. And whether that quality of life takes place in their country of birth or in another country, um, we are going to be making recommendations for how or what things ought to be considered um, in moving forward. You have been very specific in the um, question that you raised, and certainly we will be taking that into consideration if it's not already being addressed in the labor component. Uh, excellent. So we look forward to, you know, students who travel within the region to possibly have a free orientation here and to look for jobs in different um, countries. Now we're going to continue this conversation, but before we do that, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back right after this. See you soon. Good morning, good morning, and welcome back to Good Morning Tobago. So this morning, we have been chatting with the Crime and Security Manager at the CARICOM Secretariat, Mr. Stephenson. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning again. But it has been a pleasure chatting with you in regards to the migration policy that is being developed by CARICOM in regards to migration between Caribbean um, countries. Um, now, why do you think that it is crucially important for persons to understand elements of the policy or why it's important to have this policy? Okay, it's, it's really important that persons understand um, what we are doing because this is being crafted for them and by them. The migration policy, as I've indicated, um, looks at several thematic areas on the migration and we've grouped them into three um, for ease of reference, um, one of the thematic areas that we're looking at has to do with border security and protection. 
Another area, another important area looks at our human and social development and labor components. And a third critical component of the migration policy looks at um, sustainability and displacement created by natural phenomena especially. So outlined in all those are really the, the, the reasons why people move from place to place. Um, people move for different reasons. And we want to be able to capture all of these reasons based on what you, the citizen, through the national consultations, will be identifying and have already identified as your priority for movements. You have indicated um, earlier on, um, in just in a simple discussion with you, my host today, that um, there's an important consideration that we need to take into being. And this is why it's important um, that we continue to hear from our normal citizens, our citizens who are moving, as to what their challenges have been with moving and what would they like to see resolved. So I'm glad you've opened that door and the door is still open for persons to be able to identify what their challenges are and where we can make their life and their mobility even better. So how can persons um, really be a part of the conversation or just contribute their ideas similar to what I have just done? Okay, so the current status stream that we're under right now is cons is uh, the and and supporting national consultations. So once we've finished with our technical review of what the consultant has presented so far, based on um, initial and initial round, a second in, second round of consultations, um, this would be taken to um, our member states. What they are being encouraged to do and what we are be supporting them to do is to hold national consultations around the areas that the policy itself has identified. And this is one of the areas where persons would be able to um, identify what their challenges and, and hopes are. Additionally, there's a strong social media platform that is being developed um, and we'll be engaging with citizenry um, in this media and we're hoping that that would again capture a lot of those um, areas that you've discussed. Um, and in this instance, we're really looking um, particularly at the youth demographic, which you fall into, um, to advise as to what the policy itself does. The policy itself is not going to be a document that is going to be a standalone on the shelf, um, but it has some sustainability built into it. And when I say sustainability built into it, we are also looking at what capacity needs to be developed within member states to be able to interrogate and to continue to interrogate the challenges and the opportunities that arise um, as we move forward, any emergent um, challenges that arise for us to be able to deal with those things and to provide the kind of toolkit for persons to move forward. So this platform is another way where persons are going to be uh, very much engaged. And of course, we're going to be mainstreaming our young persons um, going forward as well. And this is a third area where we will be getting input from um, the, citizenry, the citizenry of CARICOM to be able to tell us what you want for your regional migration and national migration policies. All right. Has the policy or members of the committee, you know, discuss areas that um, revolve around sport and creativity? For example, we know that Jamaica has been leading the way in regards to their international, you know, athletic performance. They, and, you know, so a lot of persons within the region are looking at the framework that Jamaica has, especially when it comes to track and field. Does the policy allow for the smooth transition of athletes between countries to train, to learn, and to develop their talents? Okay, so what, what you've identified crosses between training capacity and the diaspora, which is, is, is really important that we continue to reach out to persons who have left our shores and reside in what we con consider to be third states. Certainly, um, that is one of the considerations. And once, and I'm urging persons, once the national consultations begin to, like as you have, um, identify your need, identify your challenges, identify your wants, so that that can all be captured within the policy framework itself, so that we can have 
a product that is useful for everyone. Right. And another example of that would also be Carnival and the creativity that comes behind that. We see that now more than ever, that even the smaller islands are expanding their Carnival product. We have a number of persons who, you know, work on the creative end of that and, you know, just exploring what the opportunities, inter-island opportunities can be you know, within these sectors. Uh, as we wrap up this morning's discussion, um, is there anything that persons ought to really understand about this? And when can we look forward to those national consultations happening? Okay, so I will start with your last question first. Um, the national convers conversations will happen um, once we have had that initial discussion with our member states and that's going to be within the next two weeks um so we'll be encouraging them of course it's up to individual member states how they would proceed from that point but we would encourage um national consultations um i would just like to say that movement is uh, something that we do naturally um and that the region has had a very very strong grounding in working with the rule of law so this is in terms of those areas that persons generally feel concerned about when they hear that we are going to be moving uh, more, or we're going to be entertaining even free movement. Our border security and intelligent networks are very, very well developed. And, and we have a lot of this work to thank through our implementing agency for crime and security, CARICOM Impacts, who continues to liaise um, internally and with third states to ensure that those persons that can disrupt our way of life, those persons that can disrupt our economic pursuits are very much pursued, are very much identified and flagged, and will be able to um, work with member states to ensure even that they don't slip from one jurisdiction to the other jurisdiction. So those forms of um, support and safety are strongly in place. Um, what we want to do now is to build on that and to allow persons to be able to move um, the way they want to uh, in an environment created that is safe for them to engage in their economic development. Thank you. All right. And, and, and finally, my last question would have to be regarding crime and the movement of criminals between countries. How has the current policy in its current form uh, addressed that? Okay, so as I was alluding to earlier, there are a lot of laws and regulations that are already in place, and the, the policy is going to be able to strengthen those. We have um, several um, relationships and several memorandum of understanding with persons within our region and without our region and third states. Border security, um, which is the mainstay of our ministries of national security and ministries of home affairs, um, are being led um, by a very responsible um, leadership, as well as the, we've got uh, one of our community councils called the Ministry of, um, Ministers of National Security and Law Enforcement, Consley. Consley meets um, at least twice per year. And all that is discussed in Consley is fed in from a lot of the network that we've created through um, meeting regularly with our chiefs of immigration or controllers of customs or chiefs of police our heads of um military institutions our financial heads of financial intelligence units as well as our heads of intelligence units so all this which we consider to be our security infrastructure is firmly in place and that is providing and continues to provide human support to member states in moving forward. Uh, we continue to grow and we continue to build on and gather the kinds of data that will allow even stronger analytical and empirical policies to be developed. So we are in good hands. There's more work to be done, but we are moving in the right direction. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Stephenson. I really appreciate your time and having this conversation with you this morning. And we look forward to being alerted on whenever those national consultations are happening and hopefully hearing from you again when that policy has been finalized. 
All right. We hope that you have a great day and that you continue all the good work that you have been doing. We're going to take a break right here and we're going to be back right after this. See you soon, guys.